Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is December 30th, 2020. Today I'm going to begin a new video series that is called The Image of God. And this is really going to be a series that is, you might consider as part two of the mystery of the beast. We're going to continue talking about the beast and I want to I want to draw your attention more particularly to where we really are now in time. The uh, the church prophets, the church preachers, and so on are leading everyone to believe that we are on the cusp of the greatest revival in history. And they're not really correct. There's something that they're not seeing. They're interpreting their prophetic revelations with respect to their theology, which is a normal thing to do. I mean, it's what, it's what everyone does. And how can you help it? Because each of us work within a paradigm that uh, we live in. Uh, the paradigm that I have is different than yours. Yours is different than uh, another person's. But each of us really is responsible for the paradigm that we live within, that we work within. We have responsibility with respect to knowing the truth, with respect to understanding what is true and what is a lie. And I think I'll go ahead and take you to a scripture dealing with that. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest, the rest of God, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Well, who is that? Well, that's God, of course. And what about the word of God? Well, that's Jesus. Jesus is the word that was made flesh. And the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow. and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. First, let me just quickly say there is uh, great confusion in the church, almost no understanding at all, concerning the difference of the soul and the spirit. People talk about the salvation of the soul, but they're, what they are almost always talking about is the salvation of the spirit. And that's why you almost only hear milk in the church. Milk, the milk of the word of God is that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And therefore you have a relationship with God. But that's where everything begins for us, but that's where it begins and ends for almost the entire church. It's, it's the whole doctrine of soul and spirit that creates the once saved, always saved, not once saved, always saved controversy. Just quickly, the reality is that 
we are all once saved, always saved. And that's because Jesus Christ died for all. As in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All died in Adam. All shall be made alive in Christ. Jesus died for us all. When he died, he descended to Hades. He preached to the spirits who were in prison and led them out of prison. Once, once they were preached to by him, they believed. Of course, who wouldn't believe if they, if they see Jesus face to face in the spirit? And so then he led them out of the captivity of death, out of Satan's dominion. So yes, we're all once saved, always saved. The reason why so many scriptures make it sound like we're not going to remain in our salvation is because those scriptures are dealing with the salvation of the soul. Now, what is the soul? The soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. It's who you think of yourself as. We are living souls. We relate to each other on a soul level, not on a spiritual level. Because we are not totally in the Spirit yet. Even though we have received the earnest of the Holy Spirit, those of us who have believed, we still operate in the realm of the flesh and we relate to each other soul to soul. It's the soul that can still die. That's the second death of Scripture. Most people don't understand that either, that they don't understand that there are three separate deaths, spiritual death, soul death, and physical death. The second death, the lake of fire, is dealing with the soul. It's dealing with the, ultimately the salvation of your soul because it's in the lake of fire. It's when you are exposed to the application of the word of God that your soul is renewed, your mind is renewed by the word of God. That's what the lake of fire is for and that's what it's all about. It's not an eternal torment in flaming fire as the church teaches. What you find is that most of the doctrines of the church are wrong. They're simply wrong. And so the church today does not expect what is about to happen. My previous video series on the mystery of the beast has prepared those of you who have enough diligence to listen to be ready for what is coming. As I teach there, Donald Trump is the eighth head of the beast. Donald Trump has received a mortal wound, and it appears even today on December 30th, 2020, that he is going to die politically. He, his administration, his presidency is going to die. And of course, if he ended up losing, he couldn't be the eighth head of the beast, could he? So everything that I've previously said is wrong. And if that's the case, well, I'll admit that I was wrong, but I don't believe I'm wrong. This is the time we live in. We are right now engaged in the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon is the battle for the mind. Your mind has now to come under the dominion and control of the Word of God, of Jesus Christ. It is, it is extremely important for that to happen now. I recently listened to a short uh, video by a man named Samuel Owens that basically he is saying that most of the church is, is not ready for what's going to happen. 
They're not, they believe that they are going to see in this great revival that they are going to see a manifested God, a manifested power of the Holy Spirit. And he rightly says, no, you're not. You can't handle it because most of you would die like Ananias and Sapphira because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And I would, I would just guess that 99% plus of Christians lie to the Holy Spirit. They don't see themselves as being fully accountable to God, to the Holy Spirit, in every act that they do. Now, the sad reality is we still live in the flesh, and so we do still sin. And as John especially teaches us in 1 John, if we do sin, then we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Now, being the eighth head of the beast, Donald Trump is going to fulfill the scriptures found in Revelation chapter 13. And while I'm thinking of it, I want to take us to... um, After this, I want to take us to Hebrews chapter 5, but we might look at something in 6 as well. But Hebrews chapter 13, it deals with the beast that rises from the sea that has 10 horns and 7 heads. We learn in chapter 17 that we see that beast again. But the angel reveals that one of those heads returns in an eighth head, an eighth king. That eighth head, that eighth king is Donald Trump. The previous head that returns is Cyrus. And you can do, you can find quite a bit concerning Trump coming back in the spirit of Cyrus from various church prophets today. You you will find that. Now, interestingly, we have a second beast that comes. This is a beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like a Christian or the church, or Jesus. In other words, it's going to be a prophetic, religious utterance that looks like it's right, but yet it speaks like the devil. It speaks like Satan. And what is he going to do? It exercises all the authority of the first beast, which is Donald Trump, in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So Donald Trump's mortal wound is going to be healed. He is going to be president. And I have supported him and I still support him because he is God's anointed. Just as Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus were God's anointed kings who were also heads of the beast that has ruled the earth for millennia. So Donald Trump is God's anointed. Daniel was very faithful to Nebuchadnezzar and to Cyrus. Verse 13, This second beast performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. 
the image of the beast. The image of the beast. Remember, back in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. And he set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Who do you think that image was of? Of course, it was an image of Nebuchadnezzar. And it was patterned after the dream he had where he was the head of gold. That's chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So Daniel interprets the dream, and in the dream, several succeeding heads of Babylon, of Mystery Babylon, are revealed, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar, who was the third head of the beast. So we have Nebuchadnezzar, who makes an image of gold to himself. And then, prophetically fulfilling that, we are going to see Donald Trump have an image erected to him. This is the image of the beast. The image that Nebuchadnezzar raised up to himself was an image of the beast. Who is the beast? The beast is man. The beast is man. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And I don't believe the word a is there. It is the number of man, and his number is 666. Created on the sixth day, he never, ever, in himself can become God. But what we are seeing today, and we're already seeing it, are the false prophets, the New Age false prophets, including many Christians. And I just watched a video yesterday by a woman who considers herself a Christian interviewed by a man who considers himself a Christian, who recently wrote and published a book wherein she called herself a scribe, and she literally was channeling a demon who was pretending to be God the Father. I read about 25 pages of the book, and it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. I've also listened to a couple of the New Age prophets recently, some of their videos. I, I believe God has drawn me to listen to them. And recently I, I have been astounded by the things that they've been saying. What have they been saying? Well, one very popular one, actually a couple very popular ones, have been doing videos about how human beings were basically genetically modified and led by at least 12 different alien races, including reptilians, Arcturians, Pleiadians, and others. I don't, I don't remember their names offhand. But they really believe this. They, they really believe that we are somehow the offspring of these aliens, that these aliens have had, had to do with our evolution, our be, being in our, in our current um, human frame. Well, it's nonsense. It's errant nonsense. Aliens are always manifestations of demons. Now these people who believe this do not 
believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. They're talking about things like a, a Christed consciousness now. They use that term. They're, they're using the term Christ to describe what the place where they believe they are in. They believe that they are awakened because they see the... Um, they see the control grid that mankind has been under for some time now. <clears throat> and they believe that they've awakened to that, that somehow they're going to be better than the evil that has controlled the world for millennia. Well, they're not going to be better. They can't be better because they are still the beast. They have taken the mark of the beast because everything that they believe and live is of their beastly human nature. Now I want to remind everybody of something. When Jesus was born, where did they lay him? The scripture, or we usually hear the word manger. He was laid in a manger. What is a manger? It's a feeding trough, a feeding trough for animals. He was laid there because he came in order to be our food. That's what he said. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in you. Of course, those words, and he said this, these words are spiritual. Well, many of his disciples left him at that time, but I didn't leave. I know that those words are spiritual and, and that they are not to be literally taken. Again, one of the principles that I teach is that everything Jesus taught, he taught in a parable. The scriptures say that. Well, that means also that all of the word of God, as well as being historically true, is also a parable or an allegory. It tells a spiritual story. A sp it gives a spiritual principle. So Jesus is coming as a baby and being laid in a feeding trough is a parable. He is our food. He came to be our food. But men reject him. He is the stumbling stone. Why do they reject him? because they want to believe that they themselves are responsible for their salvation. People want to think that they can do it, that they're good enough. They don't need somebody else to give it to them. Well, I have news for you. You will never get in based upon your own efforts. You can't do it. You cannot be good enough to get into the kingdom of God. You can't make it. When you read the end of the book, Revelation 21 and 22, it talks about New Jerusalem. And it tells us who is outside of New Jerusalem. And it lists people of various sins. Go there and read it and you'll find you still are there. You're, you still commit one or more of the sins that are listed there. You still lie, perhaps. Or you still commit adultery or perhaps fornication? Maybe you're a homosexual. Well, you're committing fornication. And homosexuality itself is specifically condemned in the scripture. But people now want to justify their actions. And many people have become Christians and they've stayed within their sinful behavior, whether it's living with someone outside of marriage, whether it's a homosexual relationship or whether it's working for the government doing evil deeds or working for a corporation doing evil deeds. People, by doing that, you take the mark of the beast. You have to make up your mind that you are going to serve God. 
Now, how was it that I was able to discern that these people that I watched yesterday and some days previous were false? Well, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Now, he's talking about Jesus being of the order of Melchizedek and being our high priest. And he says, about this we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Well, isn't that the truth? The entire church is dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God, the basic principles of Scripture. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, in the teaching about righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Notice, food, solid food, food is the word of God. He's not talking about eating something tangible, an apple, or cheese, or bread. Milk. He's not talking about sucking on lamb's milk or cow's milk. Solid food is the word of God. It's for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. How often do you read the Bible for yourself? Do you just go to church once a week and depend upon the preacher to give you a word? Well, you might get one verse. You might get one nugget of truth once a week if you do that, if you even get that. I've sat through sermons before where I don't even think I received one nugget of truth. Now, I want to say this before I go on from here. John the Baptist was born in a priestly family. His father was a priest. Remember, it was when he went into the temple to minister to God that an angel told him that he would have a son. And then... He became mute because he didn't believe the angel's word. Well, John the Baptist was born. His mother was of the tribe of Aaron. She was a Levite. His father was a Levite of, the, um, of Abijah, of the group that uh, were one of, I believe it was 24 different uh, clans that ministered in the temple as priests. So John the Baptist could have been a priest. And in fact, it, he was 30 years old when he began his ministry as the voice of one who cries in the wilderness, make your path straight for the Lord. He was 30 years old and that would have been the year of his ordination into the priesthood. But he disdained that. He had nothing to do with the established church order. The established church order of that time was the priesthood of Israel. After the death of Christ, that was changed to the Christian church. And for the last 2,000 years, we have had an established church order of Christian pastors, prophets, apostles, teachers, <clears throat> evangelists. Now, that age is now over. The church age is now over. And so I come to you today, not as a messenger of the church, not as a preacher in the church, but as someone who stands outside of the church. 
because we are now on the cusp of something that the church doesn't see. Now, many of the church leaders, pastors and prophets, have had dreams and visions wherein they see things that clearly show that the time of this nation, the Republic of the United States of America, is over. That Jesus himself is turning out the lights on that system. But they refuse to go where those revelations take them. See, what we're seeing is the, the shaking of everything that can be shaken and the destruction of the things of men. And we're going to see the rising of the kingdom of God. So we now are at the time where we are going to see the kingdom of God rise up. And we need to know that because we are about to see some, in the flesh, terribly scary things. Because when Donald Trump begins his second term and then he receives all the accolades of the people, who can fight against the beast? Who can wage war against Donald Trump, the man who received the mortal wound but yet survived? And he becomes puffed up in his pride like Nebuchadnezzar did, like every man does, because it, he's a man of flesh. You're, you're of the flesh. I'm of the flesh. As long as I'm in the flesh, I will fail. But we're coming now to the time when God is going to manifest in beings who are no longer of the flesh. That's what the image of God is all about. So this is the introduction to the image of God understanding what the image of God is. Because just as man always raises an image to himself in self-applause and self-worship, God is going to raise up those who are made, fully made, in his image. And in the next video, what we're going to do is look into scriptures that deal with being made into the image of God.